All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you guys for listening, watching another episode of uh, The Stivers Show. Very excited about my guest today, uh, Sarah Chapman. Hello, Sarah. How's it going? Hi. Good. How are you? Good, good. So Sarah is uh, works with Zoo Miami, Zoo Miami Foundation as the uh, development coordinator of individual giving. And uh, we were having some, some good conversation <laughs> before we started filming. So I'm excited about this. Um, you know, I kind of have just an interest in, in the zoo in general and, uh, you know, our mutual uh, friend, uh, Yvette, kind of put us to put us together. And so, you know, I was just kind of interested in, in speaking with you and kind of hearing, you know, what's going on with the zoo in general. Obviously, we're still in the midst of this uh, <laughs> pandemic, so I'm sure that's adding to some challenges. But just wanted to, you know, maybe people watching, listening aren't too familiar with the zoo and all that you all are doing anyway. So I thought that would be, this is a good opportunity to, to maybe bring a little bit of like fun and joy in an otherwise, you know, maybe down type of time. So, <laughs> but uh, we got a lot, we probably got lots to talk about, but I always like to, you know, kind of start with uh, maybe having you just say a little bit about, about who you are and, and what you do. Sure. Well, I'm super excited for the show. Um, hopefully I'm not the most boring guest, but I definitely have animal stories to boot. So, um, so my name is Sarah Chapman. I basically, my journey into the nonprofit world um, began, um, I lived in Africa for a little bit, kind of doing frontline conservation efforts. And when I moved back to the States, wanted to work in animal care, which drew me to Zeus. Um, and from there, uh, I started realizing the more knowledge I got in conservation and the efforts of zoos and really where my passion lies is the bigger picture of conservation of all wildlife. So having learned that that kind of is an economic issue and a, and a financial issue kind of at its core, I ended up thinking I could do the most fulfilling work with our foundation and raising money not only for our zoo, but also for, you know, worldwide conservation efforts and really getting money where it needs to go, um, as well as, you know, the, those important projects for the zoo that we also fundraise for um, that I'm passionate about. Because to me, I was a zookeeper at Zoo Miami. So those are like my kids. So uh, my husband says, he was like, you basically have a job where you just brag on your kids all day. So i um, happy to do that. So that's kind of my little journey and how I got to the foundation and, and really championing um, the efforts of our foundation. Uh, so, so maybe to start, so how, I guess, how long has Miami Zoo, you know, Zoo Miami been around? And I don't know if this is a, a correct question, but what's kind of like, for those who are skeptical of zoos in general, what's kind of like the overall purpose goals of, of Zoo Miami? Sure. So I think, well, first of all, Zoo Miami is 40 years old. We celebrated 40 years this year. It wasn't the most celebratory year as we had intended it to be. Um, so our tagline for this year was 40 years of conservation. So that's really what's at the core of zoos. But most people look at zoos like they were 40 years ago, which was a very different site. Um, you know, smaller cages, actual cages, um, enclosures, you know, people that care for those animals always cared for those animals. There's, you know, um, but we've learned better and better and better ways to care for the animals um, under human care um, in zoos over the last 40 years. And it's become an, an incredible focus. In my personal opinion, probably in the last 15 years or so, zoos have had a renaissance of um, really becoming the forefront of animal welfare and um, also conservation worldwide. I think if you look at um, the biggest impacts on worldwide conservation, um, a group called the AZA um, is one of the largest contributors. And what AZA is, is kind of this overarching um, qualification that uh, I think around 270, just under 300 zoos in the country are a part of, including Zoo Miami. So um, this accreditation is called the, is an AZA accredited facility. The AZA does probably some of the most intensive, um, it's a several month long process to get accredited. And basically what that means is they come in, they evaluate your animal care, your practices, your, your food has to be USDA regulated. I swear our gorillas eat better than I do. Um, we used to look at all their fruit and say, oh my gosh, this is like the best stuff ever. Um, and they really just look at your entire institution and what and what goes into it, including the mental health of your animals, the physical health, um, their day-to-day -day care, and they then accredit you and you're um, basically get this, this um, 
certificate of um, status among zoos. And like I said, there's hundreds and thousands of zoos in this country, um, backyard zoos and big zoos, and some even big zoos are not accredited. Um, so there's a really elite group of about a little less than 300 zoos that have this accreditation. So you know you're really at a good facility if they have that accreditation. Um, so uh, it's definitely something I always say that zoos have a PR issue because of how everything can call itself a zoo, but it doesn't really mean um, much unless you have that accreditation. So, so I it is in my backyard and call it a zoo. <laughs> gotcha. So I, I'm curious, I mean, and maybe this is a dumb question, I'm not sure, but is, you know, is, do you all keep animals like for, for the lifetime of the, of the animal or is the goal, hey, let's rehabilitate them and get them back out or a little bit of both? So it's really rare that we have rehabilitation cases. So typically that is a rehab center and that's kind of where we differ a bit. Um, that's not to say we don't have rehab cases. Um, most of our, one of our newest exhibits, um, Florida Mission Everglades, all those native species, they're native Florida species, were one way or another unreleasable by a rehab center. So they're kind of serving as ambassadors for their species at our zoo. So they're not be able to be released in the wild. So they're now under our care. Um, so that's bald eagles. We have two black bears. We have alligators. We have, um, oh my goodness, we have bobcats um, that came from kind of all different ways. Um, but uh, we also have a panther that came from, from uh, fish and wildlife. Um, again, not releasable. So for one reason or another, um, so those are really our rehab cases, um, but they don't go back into the wild once they've come to a zoo. Really where zoos, um, we also don't pull from the wild as much as people assume. I think people think we're ripping these animals from the wild. That's a very antiquated. This AZA accreditation, so this certification board, um, once you're part of a, an AZA zoo or a facility, we actually have, um, pretty much all of our animals are bred within those facilities and they get rotated and transferred within. I like to tell people there's a kind of a secondary um, tier um, organization called the Species Survival Plan or the SSP. Um, that kind of is like thinking of it like a genetic online dating service for animals in zoos. Um, we swap animals a lot um, between zoos for breeding purposes um, to create clean genetic lines. We can't just breed the same lions over and over. That really doesn't serve much of a purpose. Um, something that zoos are working towards is artificial insemination. So um, basically, if you're looking at an endangered species in the wild, you're looking at the, a really, really tiny population. Once they're considered endangered, um, even if we perfectly protect them, oftentimes you're getting interrelated animals that are breeding, so you're not perpetuating a healthy genetic population. Where zoos come in is we very carefully manage the breeding and who gets to breed and who doesn't get to breed, and we create very diverse genetic pools in captivity. And with some animals, science is caught up enough, so your larger animals like elephants and rhinos, we can actually artificially inseminate. So we could, in theory, when if a population got so small, we could technically artificially inseminate clean genetics into the wild. So while we wouldn't release our animals, we could help the wild population by being responsible breeders in captivity by doing this artificial insemination. Oh, very, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. So, you know, I, obviously we've got COVID and everything going on right now. How has that kind of affected, affected you all? And the animals. I know we were talking a little bit that most people don't think about that, um, yeah. but I think you said they're susceptible to, to catching it as well. Absolutely. It's kind of the fancy word is a zoonotical disease, which means it can go either to or from an animal or back and forth. From what we're to understand about this particular virus is that it terminates once it gets to an animal. We don't necessarily, we can't catch it from an animal in terms of contact the way you would with people. Um, obviously there's differences if you're consuming animals. Um, I don't know as much about that, but right now they believe once it reaches one of the animals that we would have at the zoo, that it, it stops there. Um, but we do, we learned, um, that all of our large cat species, so your lions, your tigers, um, I believe cheetahs, um, can get this virus as well as our great apes, pretty much our great apes. So your chimps and your gorillas and your orangutans can get whatever we get, even just a small sniffle of a cold. So I used to help take care of our um, chimps and gorillas at the zoo and we had to wear PPE if we even had a sniffle. 
Um, so now with COVID, we do have PPE protocol in place when you're working with any of these animals. Um, so, you know, with this great shortage of PPE that went around, obviously we're at the bottom of those lists, but that is necessary for us to be able to provide the best care. So that was something that I think we're proud to have been able to provide to our keepers, um, proper PPE throughout this, the virus. Um, but yeah, I think people weren't really realizing that we can't take, you can't feed a great ape, you can't interact with any of our great apes or care for them in their general day-to-day -day life without a PPE on um, in order for their protection and as well as ours. So that was something that I think people started to learn as things moved on. We've shared it with our donors and the public, but definitely. And, and have you all reopened? I mean, as far as, you know, I probably not full capacity, but are people yep. back visiting or? Yeah, so we were out closed. Another fun fact that I think people in this community didn't realize was during COVID, the zoo was closed longer than it was for Hurricane Andrew. So we were closed 144 days, I believe. Wow. Um, is really impactful because a lot of what supports the zoo is um, tickets and memberships and, and different things like that. People actually being able to come out to the zoo is a huge way that we support the zoo. So um, we are open now and limited capacity. Um, I think we're still at a third capacity. So they still have to book online, get your tickets. Um, but again, we're an open air park. So nowhere better to be um, <laughs> open air park and masks are required in the park as well. Curious, because you've been in this world of working with animals and, and Zoo Miami for, for a little while. And, you know, you said you were a, uh, what did you say, zookeeper? Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> zookeeper <Yeah>. before. <laughs> and then, you know, now kind of on the more fundraising efforts and, and things. But so I'm wondering if you have a perspective of where you, you know, where you think you see the future of zoos, of zoos going. Because I, I agree, there, there is probably a PR problem <laughs> for them. And, and you really don't, I, I don't even really think about zoos that much. It just does kind of seems like an older, an older thing and, or maybe something that, that uh, children go to, I guess, while in school for like, you know, field day and stuff like that. But where do you kind of see, see the futures of zoos going? I think really zoos are a really important cornerstone in communities that it's a way, it's a window into another world that why would a tiger be important to you? Um, unless you've seen one um, or had that experience. Um, and it really is indicative of the health of our, I think everyone's learning. I think during COVID, some of the most interesting articles I read were, you know, all of the smog over these big cities cleared because everyone wasn't driving. And um, I believe it was like dolphins and swans started re-entering into the Venice canals and wildlife started coming back. So I think we learned how resilient our earth can be and I think zoos are a great way that you're never gonna, you might never see a swan in a canal in Venice, but there's a way for you to see these types of incredible creatures in your own backyard and realize how interconnected we are. So I think zoos, not only in the science and things that are kind of going on behind the scenes like artificial insemination and, and, and clear breeding, I think they have such an important place for children to understand their impacts on the environment and the small ways that they can help at home. Um, actually in January, we're opening a brand new exhibit. Um, I, we believe the only one of its kind to exist um, called the Conservation Action Center. It's an interactive indoor exhibit where you can, you kind of start your journey in the building. It's a U-shaped building. You start your journey kind of looking 30,000 feet up like at a polar bear. How do I relate to a polar bear and why? And it walks you through the journey of a polar bear or another one of those, a bantang, so like an endangered cow, basically. Um, why do you, <laughs> do you connect to that at all? Um, and it shows you not only what our zoo is doing, but then at the end, you walk in an interactive home and you can touch things in the home and it teaches you like, oh, if you make sure to, you know, fix your uh, leaky save X number of water and that impacts X number of species. And you can start to pledge, it brings it right back to home. So just because we're here in South Florida doesn't mean what we do doesn't have an impact on sea turtles, on polar bears, on you know climate change affects us all um, and nature affects us all. So the more we encroach on nature, there's an imbalance that happens. So I think that's where zoos really this, it's a giant education center. Our educational programs see half a million kids in our community uh, a year, which is huge impact. Um, not only the nearly 1 million people that come to the zoo a year. So you reach those people. We hope that through 
our signage and our keeper talks, people are starting to really get a, an idea of how connected, as, as hippie as that might sound, we really all are. And you recycling bottles at home really does make a difference. Um, I think the coolest feature in the beginning of this new exhibit it goes from the floor to the ceiling of this industrial building that we have, and it is a giant, um, you can see crushed, it, basically anything that we cleaned up at the beaches, and it was all from our local beaches. We cleaned up trash and things from the beaches and filled it so people could see just, this is our own beaches. You know, this is stuff that we're doing just here in South Florida. This was from Key Biscayne. This is from South Beach. All of that pollution um, and how that affects polar bears and sea turtles and everything. Um, Panthers here in Florida, in the Everglades, we pollute the Everglades, it pollutes our water source, it pollutes so many things. So I think zoos really, not only do they have that scientific, harder for people to touch impact on the wild, um, they also serve this really important educational uh, component to, to the world that I think can't we can't do without right now, especially now. Yeah, I think that's very well said. Very, very well <laughs> said. And I like the I like the idea of, or I like the the visualization or of you know kind of seeing into this world that you wouldn't otherwise kind of, uh, you know, get to know about, and you feel a little bit more connected when you see something like that. And you're like, oh wait, that you know, you have yeah. more of a, you know, experience for that. Because and then I know one thing we talked about. You speaking of kind of getting into the world that you wouldn't <laughs> otherwise have a entrance into is uh, the baby anteater. So what's oh, going on with that? <laughs> I know, little Ziggy. Um, so this has become um, a little phenomenon that we weren't prepared for. Uh, little Ziggy is a giant anteater ant baby who was born, uh, I believe on December 8th. It was one of, during that really, really cold front that we had. Um, and mom, for, one, for whatever reason, um, didn't opt to be a mom. Uh, she had somewhat abandoned him through the night. So the keepers did what they could thinking, not sure if she just, you know, animals are not always the most intuitive. So we thought she's been a good mom in the past. We thought maybe something was wrong with the baby, had the vets check it out, kind of bring it back, tried to introduce it back to her. And again, for one reason or another, uh, she did not accept this baby back. So our keepers- That's very sad. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's... I, I know, like it's not the most heartwarming story other than, I mean, that happens. Um, yeah. and it's not, she's not a bad mom. She's raised babies before. We're not quite sure. This is a very premature, small baby. So that might've been something that she maybe thought was wrong with it. And so she was kind of doing what they would do naturally. So we ended up taking him in from the keepers and uh, the keepers are now raising this baby anteater who's just looks like this tiny, adorable little alien at this point. Um, his name is Ziggy. And again, this is something that zoos encounter all the time is if we do end up having to get into a hand rearing situation, which is not what we want. We don't pull babies for mom just to pull babies for mom. Our hope is it's a lot of work. So we're hoping always that mom takes care of baby. And if she doesn't, we're prepared. But these keepers had to overnight, we are ordering, um, I, this is going to sound so silly, but I was on the phone with a nipple distributor in Missouri trying to get nipples that fit this particular baby's mouth. And we had all had a very good laugh because my colleagues were like, why are you on the phone screaming about nipples? <laughs> <laughs> and I, my husband's like, this is your job. I was like, I cannot get this distributor to get this particular nipple here to Miami in a very short time. That's hilarious. So yeah, we, I mean, these supplies, these little things that come up Yes, we're a county zoo, but these little things that come up um, that are not budgeted for always. <laughs> so that's kind of where we rely on, uh, on donors. And we've had a couple fantastic donors that immediately jumped into action, um, but we're starting to see a huge public interest in Ziggy right now. And from everything from, he now needs a stuffed animal to hold on to at night. Normally he would hold on to mom. So we had to get him, and the only thing that kind of shaped like his mom was an alligator stuffed animal. Um, so he now has that as a buddy. Um, they have a little carry-all bag that they have to buy him and they had to make an incubator that fit him. Um, all sorts of these little things that you would never think about um, become a, a need and an urgent necessity. So that's those are the types of things that it's fun for us to call upon the community because I think it's definitely a story they can get behind. 
Um, and it just, I think we did the press release on Friday and I'm supposed to be off and I'm fielding emails and text messages from people all over the place, um, wanting to donate for Ziggy, which, um, has been really fun. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to look up pictures after this. You but. do. <laughs> <laughs> so talking to, you know, kind of, I know we're coming up on our time, but talking a little bit about, you know, the need that, that you all have and everything, what's, what's kind of the, the best way for people to get involved? What are you all looking for right now? What do you all need and, and all of that? And then how can they do that? How, how can they get involved? Yeah, there's so many ways. Um, we're a very creative bunch. We're also a small bunch at the, uh, at the Zoo Miami Foundation, but um, basically on our website, zoomiami.org, um, there's a support tab and it is just a laundry list of ways that you can support because we understand that everyone wants to just donate blindly. Some people want to become a part of the zoo. So we have a young professionals group um, that you and I were talking about earlier that a, a great colleague of mine, Natalie, runs. Um, that a vet is a part of wonderfully. Um, and we have a premier membership. So we have a lot of people that are members, but there's a way to be a premier member, which means you're paying above and beyond the membership amount. You're getting some incredible experiences along with that and some benefits, but it's really becoming part of our donor family by being a premier member. So people might not realize that that is a tier of membership that basically helps support um, all of our initiatives which is conservation, education, and supporting our zoo. So all of that goes into all of our members actually helped to fund. We are going to, I think this is public knowledge, hopefully I can get in trouble for this. Um, we have this, we're gonna be a sea turtle triage center. So between Marathon and Jupiter, Florida, there is not a sea turtle hospital. And we have four incredible, amazing vets that are fully qualified to, um, handle these exotic animals. We cannot rehabilitate them and keep them from long periods, but boating accidents, things like that. We have a huge stretch of beach with some of the biggest population of sea turtles outside of Marathon and Jupiter. And so we, in partnership with the city and, and some other organizations, we are becoming a, a sea turtle triage center. So we have a sea turtle hospital being built all from a membership dollars, um, which is incredible. So they, memberships, they, everything makes a difference. Adopting an animal helps us provide enrichment, which is basically mental uh, health for our animals. Every single day, every single animal in our zoo gets enrichment in one way or another, which is basically helping to encourage natural behaviors. So none of our animals at the zoo live the same day over and over. Every day is different for them. Our lions will spray perfume on the trees, so they mark. Um, so you might not see enrichment, but it is there. Uh, the keepers, that's probably one of our biggest jobs is creating something different in their environment every day. And there's a fund for that that's funded by a million things, but adopt an animal is one of them. You can buy a brick. There's, if you look at that, support, a lot of, yeah. so many ways, so many ways to, to support um, and just really keeping an eye out for your zoo or just coming out to the zoo can help. Awesome. You. And we'll make sure to, you know, put the website and links and everything. Sure. Uh, on yeah. there. And so maybe, you know, last question before we, before we part ways is, you know, what, cause you're clearly very passionate about this <laughs> and, and, and love what you do. So what, what would you say that, you know, to get more people involved, you know, what, you know, how can you, what do you say to your donors and, and people to kind of promote and say, Hey, listen, you need to be a, you need to be a part of this. I think the number one question, if I run into someone on the streets, like, oh, I love the zoo. And I say, well, when was the last time you were there? And most people say, oh gosh, I think I was in middle school. And so much has changed. So again, that whole PR issue we talked about earlier, if you haven't been to a zoo in a long time, you're not really gonna difference. I think, I think our tiger exhibits almost two acres. And there's just these things that people aren't really seeing these innovative, incredible things that the zoo's doing. You can't see it if you haven't been there. So I think that's the best way to start. We just, and we always just invite people to come out. Um, I think people think we're in Timbuktu down in 152, <laughs> but uh, we're well, not that's that, true. We're not <laughs> that me, far. <laughs> we're not that far. Think about going on a safari. You're coming down. Um, I, I, we just always encourage people to pop up, come down um, and, or reach out to our foundation, um, you know, we're, we're always happy to give people tours and, and really, you know, give some one-on-one -on -one attention to people that are really interested in getting engaged with us and, and seeing, and it's really up to the people what, what, what they want to see from their zoo and their money can do that. Um, so whatever they're passionate about, we're happy to make sure they get to the right fund or the right area of the zoo that, that speaks to them.
we have some great elephant passionate people that just want to give to our elephants. And then we have people that are like, oh, I just want to give to education and all those things are possible. Um, so there's some awesome. ways to, to definitely help wildlife and help our zoo. Awesome. Sarah, it's been fun. You were definitely not the uh, the most <laughs> most boring guest. Very so nervous. That was awesome. That. <laughs> that was awesome. No, thank you so much. I appreciate all, all you do and uh, yeah. talk to you soon. Thanks again. Appreciate yes. it. Thanks, Justin. Bye.